there's w ways to work within it uh, and, and maybe do something a little bit different um, without, you know, just saying, forget it, I'm going to move to a shack in the middle of nowhere, you know. You can still be involved and maybe shift the dial a little bit while you're at it, maybe. Oh, we're already going. All right, all right. Man, I don't know about this outfit. It was a little pretentious. You're looking pretty sharp. You got like this, like uh, like psychedelic night show host. I'm not, I promise I'm not on. stealing the blue suit from you. I love when you wear it. <laughs> we're, we're thinking about going there. For hey, me. that you know, that, I don't have a trademark on the blue suit. Go there, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is exciting. This is uh, great. <laughs> songwriter, producer. Sound designer and sound artist performer are these four uh, mediums or are they four elements of a single medium? Oh, great first question. Um, it's it's difficult for me. I think I've always had a a little bit of a challenge describing what I do. A little bit of a jack of all trades, maybe. Um, so maybe I. Do you think of them as branches on the same tree? If that answers the question. Sure. Exactly. Um, I don't know. Songwriter first, I think. Uh, performer, sound artist, producer, a little later. So maybe I'll, if we're giving it a hierarchy. Why songwriter first? Um, just because that's what drew me in at the very beginning. It's sort of the, the seed of what got me into music in the first place. It, um, I, I was never like, oh, I'm going to be the best guitar player. It was, oh, I can make a thing. I, I can make an original work. You know, I can come up with a melody or I can make a little song or maybe I can do a larger piece. And um, so, so the idea of bringing something new into the world was what excited me the most whenever I was very, very young. And then... You want to perform your song. You want to produce your song, and those sort of those things sort of came along by necessity from the original seed. Yeah. You you have many elements to the the tree music, which I am a huge fan of, by the way. Thank you. Um, art pop or art rock. What's what? <laughs> what is it? Um, I think. Ooh, oh, that's tough. Um, I think a lot of the artists that I love describe themselves as art rock or art pop. Uh, and I think that that word art um, just adds a, a different clarification um, to the intention of the work, maybe, hopefully. Um, you know, if you just say pop, you know, a lot of people are just gonna think top 40. You know, if you just say rock, a lot of folks are just going to think about all oh, the bar band down the street or something. I don't know. Um, but, you know, art rock or art pop, they do have run the risk of being slightly pretentious uh, genre names. Um, but I think it, it implies that, that the composition or the execution is um, a, little, a little left of the dial, I guess. Um, another word I've heard you describe about yourself or your your predilections or your own music um specifically 60s pop oh yes this is another maybe just like um childhood thing it was all about hendrix and the beatles and uh um this sort of um and 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 the time period itself and, and all the cultural uh, and social movements that go along with it, but also thinking about that idea of in today where like, um, you know, in the 60s you had a, a very sort of clean cut, relatively conservative population for the most part. And then you have this big, um, I don't want to say uprising, but um, a lot of things came about in, in the culture that were the total opposite of that 
And I think that there's a, a part of me that just, just loves that to death. And, and any other time that I've seen it in, in music history where music really um, uh, changes the cultural conversation in a way. I think it happened with hip hop in the 80s and early 90s as well. Um, you know, I think there's a, a lot of other um, musical time periods, maybe to different degrees or, you know, different intensities um, that were also able to affect the world. Um, but also, I just love that music from that time, too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kind of like a, maybe a modern-day troubadour. Uh, that word has come up a, a strange amount for me recently. Really? <laughs> yeah. Any reason in particular? Or? I don't, it's a little serendipity. That oh. word keeps kind of floating in, so I'm not sure what that means yet, but it does keep making an appearance. Well, and I've, I've gotten to know you primarily as a solo artist. Mm-hmm. That's the limit of my experience, at least working with you, and a lot of the music of yours that I've become familiar with is as a solo artist. And as I was doing my prep work for today, I... I dove in and realized, okay, you might be a troubadour, but you are literally, you were literally part of a band of minstrels uh, <laughs> with Hectorina. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Hectorina, I did a deep dive. I listened to every single thing I could find. Really? That you guys have put out. <laughs> That's put great. Out. And amazing, really well thought, super crafted, exciting, um, songs Mm -hmm. and man can you sing thank you thank you i just i found myself (laughs) usually when i'm listening to a lot of music these days i need to do something else so i don't have enough time in the day and a lot of the time i found myself just stopping i was like just listening and it's just some great stuff out there thanks a lot man i Um, appreciate that what was your experience with hectorina um gosh hectorina was a project that went on for a, a very long time we were together um, gigging, performing, recording um, as our main project, all three of us, um, our main project for over 10 years, maybe 12 years. Wow. And I think a couple of those years we were Dylan Gilbert and the, and the something somethings. Um, but we eventually, because I was solo whenever I was young, right out of high school for, for a few years, just really doing a troubadour thing. I was doing like coffee houses and things like that. Um, and then I ended up forming the band and, and getting to getting together with Zach and John. And, um, and that was our main thing for a long time. And we were all in just touring full time. Um, and we really had, I think the thing that makes that band special, um, to me is that we always just allowed ourselves freedom in whatever we were doing, um, which I think is still sort of my attitude now of, uh, um, you know, what feels good to us as the artist, that's what we should do. You know, that's the direction we should go in. And we always did that for better or worse. Um, you know, and, 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 and maybe there were things that we could have done to make things easier on ourselves or something like that. But, uh, but yeah, there was always a, a sense of freedom and a sense of camaraderie uh, in the band um, through that whole period. But a lot, a lot of ups and downs, a lot of different stylistic changes. Um, but we stuck it out together for a long time. Some yes, yeah, like I said, some great tracks. I loved, really enjoyed everything I heard. One that really stuck out. Um, I think I, I it stuck out not necessarily because of the musical content. But for maybe other reasons, but it's nonetheless stuck out. Collywobble. Oh, okay. Oh, you went way back. Okay. Well, I, t- I listened to everything I could find. <laughs> can, can you uh, share a little about this? Yes, absolutely. Um, and this is, um, it's funny you bring this up because especially um, kind of in my hometown, home region, um, it that project gained a little bit of traction, got a little bit of success. We were doing some festivals and things like that. Um, and it was a project that went on uh, a little longer. It lived a little longer of a life um, than I feel like most records do or projects do. You know, usually 
um, you know, you're in a punk band or, you know, um, with a group or something like that. Um, you know, release a record, maybe tour it for a couple months and, you know, maybe you're on to writing some new songs or something like that. Um, but with, with Kali Wobble, it was kind of all I thought about from about 2011 through about 2015. Um, because originally it was the first album, proper album, that Hectorina did as a band together. Um, and it was really originally like, gosh, I've got God, about a hundred little half done songs. How can we have a lot of fun with all these little melodies that are, are sitting around, stuff we've been jammed, just messing around on. And how can we glue all that together? Um, and it just turned more and more into a story and a narrative. And I, it, it was... Um, Definitely the first time that I'd ever thought about lyrically writing something that had that direct of a narrative. And I mean, it goes all in, as you know. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a full on rock opera. Um, but then after we finished the record, um, you know, printed up some co copies and, and were touring it a little bit, uh, we got asked to turn it into a stage play and ended up getting involved with some local. Um, dancers, choreographers, performers, filmmakers, and we had this whole ragtag crew um, that that put together this this big stage show that we played at a, a handful of festivals too. So, yeah, so it was a project that went on and on, which I was really happy to see. I wish that happened more often. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you you mentioned a word that I've taken some interest in. Uh, and I don't mean this necessarily about Hectorina, but it could be, but just as general. Why, why do you imagine rock needs an opera? Ooh. I love the idea of stretching out any, any genre, really. I don't know if it's just rock for me. Um, I love the idea of taking an established genre and, and just... Uh, warp in it, you know, but but maybe in a way that somebody could still listen to, and it's not so far into the avant garde, you know, that it that it might be inaccessible in some way. Um, I, my dad recently said he was like, "Yeah, you've always tried to, you know, you write pop songs, really, but you always subvert your songs." Mm -hmm. And I, I thought that that was a really succinct way to do it, and I've never really intentionally thought about it that way but I think that that was an interest of mine at the time and to an extent now still um, is to kind of subvert expectations um, so that was the fun of like oh well you know here's our debut album but it's also a giant story and um, and it, it taps into all these different other elements of music as well I've played a handful of operas. It's not my, my forte. One thing I've always been really interested in is this idea of um, how music reflects society, mm -hmm. uh, but specifically opera. You can I think it's e a little easier, at least for me, to track it. If I think mm -hmm. of, you have what's called opera buffa, which is from mm -hmm. the 18th century. You can think of composers like Rossini or Mozart. And what this is around the time of, the Enlightenment, so there's a lot of optimism um, that people are appealing to their sense of reason, yeah. and that's uh, reflected in the music. First of all, all the stories are in opera buffa make me think almost like a sitcom in that they're very formulaic. Yes. Um, it's You have recitatives and arias. The arias are the beautiful songs, essentially, mm -hmm. and the recitative move the plot right along. Right. Um, but also the tonality is fairly light, um, and a lot of the characters are... Everyday people, but maybe um, hyperbolic versions of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and usually it's uh, like someone like a servant who's putting, uh, getting the better of their master or something. Or so it's like these yeah. kind of satirical things taking on the idea of the hierarchical structures that were in place at that time. And then you jump forward maybe 150 years to the end of the 19th century of opera Verismo, which is on the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, Mascani or Puccini, these guys. Yeah. And they're writing this, well, that's at the right around the time of the Industrial Revolution. What so urbanization, really harsh working conditions, still class issues. But in art in general around that time, I think it's around the same time as 
realism and naturalism. So they're trying to, they're reacting against the over-romanticization of life. They want it to be more set set as a real thing, and they want it to be for more common people. And that's mm-hmm. very much done in the music with, first of all, there are, there are senses of arias and recitatives, but it has much more of a flow without it being actual hard stops between the two. Yeah. So it just kind of flows but also the tonality is much more rich, it's much more dissonant, um, reflecting it. And then the characters uh, that they're writing about, someone in the audience, it could be about them. So it just is much more connected to the more common person. And with this evolution of, well, it's a little reductive, but the optimism and lighthearted satire quality of the um, of the Enlightenment with Opera Buffa all the way until the more gritty uh, and more real um application with the opera of Irismo, you get a reflection of the shifts in culture and the mm. social dynamics, how they're changing. What I'm wondering is, when I think of rock opera, I think of a handful of bands, The Who, Queen, David Bowie, maybe he might not even have an actual rock opera. I don't know if there's opera. a proper David Bowie rock opera, but... David Bowie obviously has a very famous rock opera. I don't know where my head was at. Um, but it wasn't one that was inspiring me for this project. I was thinking more about song cycle type stuff like uh, the Beach Boys Smile or something like that. Oh, I don't want to say that for sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. But in, <laughs> in any case, all these, even Dream Theater to a certain sense and certainly Hectorina, what I wonder is, is opera in, in these senses, is it continuing this thread of being a reflection of where society and culture is in those times? Or is it simply exploring the word opera as a way of having a continued long-length story that would have been novel for pop or rock albums? Um, That's a great question. I think for me at the time, um, I I wasn't thinking very socially uh, at at that point in, in my artistic journey. Um, since then, I've, a lot of the work that I've made has been more focused on things that are going on in society um, and just where we are in, in, in this place and time and space. Um, <clears throat> so Kali Wobble was really more of a, a character study in a way. Um, and it, it might relate to what you were saying about these sort of... Um, embellished um, dramatized versions of people that I that I knew in real life the, these sort of caricatures of, sure. of people that I knew in my neighborhood or you know, somebody I'd gone out on a date with and things like that um, to create these sort of like um, just really dramatic versions of people um, and I did think that in this sort of opera context, maybe I can be a little more realer and raw, maybe a little more bold, maybe a little more, um, you know, um, cathartic, maybe, in a way, um, if I can put all of these feelings into these other characters. Um, so I think that Kali Wobble was a little bit of a, maybe a selfish artistic journey in that way. Um, just thinking about how those characters got down uh, and, and why they got down that, the way that they did. Does that answer the question, though? <laughs> oh, I mean, I just want to, yeah, I just want to know your thoughts on it. Sure. Because when I think of opera from, a, I hate this word, but classical context, mm. for me it seems like a big leap to think of it in a rock context. And for some reason I've always yes. um, taken issue with the term rock <clears throat> opera. And I don't know why. I have no logical reason to. It just hits me as like a... Hmm. And so when I've actually sat and given it more thought, this is kind of where I've gone with it. Mm -hmm. It feels like maybe there's this disconnected. So they're using the word to help connect the idea that there's this long narrative that can be told, which is what opera is. Yes. But um, uh, I agree, though. Rock opera is it's this very um, vague use of the term mm -hmm. opera. Like it's a little bit it's definitely borrowed like, okay, opera, but in, you know, in, um, but at the same time, um, I was in school uh, at that time, I was in music school at that time. So um, even though, you know, the rock is, is probably the more obvious influence. I was definitely thinking in sonata form with some of those oh. pieces and, you know, things like that. Um, it was 
this sort of exploration of some of the um, opera forms that I had learned at that time as well. Now, uh, probably not as direct uh, as it would need to be to call it a proper opera, of course, but, um, but yeah, there were definitely, I would have to go through it, but there were definitely bits and pieces where it was like, okay, right here, I was doing this sort of ABA thing or, or whatever. Um, so there was some experimentation with that, um, but I think rock opera, to your point, can be a bit of a catch-all term mm. uh, for, for certain musicians to just make a, a, a large narrative work. Yeah. I want to jump back a couple topics. You, you started on a thread, and then I took us over here. Apologies. Okay. Um, how can I? Okay. Um, so if... Uh, these two styles of operas, Buffa and Rismo, are reflecting. I think probably a lot of music, a lot of music has reflected culture or reflects culture and society. That's yeah. certainly a thread that's continued through into modern music. And the yeah. modern music industry right now has gone through significant transformations to deal Huge. with, um, to be able to live with, and to be able to work within the current cultural and uh, social settings, but also the technological advancements. Mm -hmm. that, this is a whole, it's a whole paradigm shift in a way. And of the many topics, there's two specific ones. I want to get your, I just want to know what you think about these. Okay. Um, the first one has a lot of s potential subtopics, but I'm just going to talk about it as a very general thing. Okay. And that is the digital revolution. Okay. What do you think about when you think about the digital revolution and is it is it a positive thing or is it wholly not positive? Uh -huh. um, well, I, I always kind of hold myself back from being somebody who's like anti-technology. And I think that there is just like a little natural... Uh, there's a little natural bit of that in me somewhere <laughs> that is like... Fuck the technology. Wait, can we curse here? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> you know, you know, screw the computers, screw the robots, and all, all that stuff. I think was even there whenever I was a kid. Maybe it's mm. from all the movies we watched growing up or something. But uh, you know, and I grew up with these with these musician parents. Um, um, you know, idealistic in in their artistic sense. You know, the way they thought about things. Um, you know, uh, and I think that that was passed on to me in some ways, but I do try not to be an anti, anti technology or anti digital, um, person. So I want to always believe that, um, the technology that's being made, um, can help people can, and can help musicians. I want to believe that at least. Well, yeah, it's certainly things like, um, well, oh. Sorry, I'm going to keep going back to it. With the, okay. with the opera Verismo, it opened up doors to many more people. First, and how it was staged, literally where it was produced, but also its content mm -hmm. just made it accessible to a lot more people. And say what you will on either end of the spectrum with digital platforms, you certainly have given thousands of millions of people more access to more music, mm -hmm. which I think is, is, a, is a net whole, is a positive. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Um, it, it, it's it's this tricky thing uh, for me because I'm also I, I know I've told you this before uh, in our chats but I think I identify as a music fan almost as much as I do a, a musician um, and, and I'm sure plenty of musicians would say the same thing but you know whenever I'm not making music I'm probably listening to music or reading about music or you know or watching a concert in the background while I'm making dinner or whatever um, so I think that the digital age for a music fan is is a dream come true every song I've ever been looking for every rare rare seven inch I've been trying to track down since the late 90s I can find it on YouTube in two seconds now um, and that's a wonderful thing. Um, I think as an artist, for people that are young and, and up and coming now, um, or, or still in it now, um, it can be easy to feel like you're just getting lost amongst the noise, your own work, um, because everybody has access to upload their song. Um, you know, I think in the early days of the internet, that felt like 
All right, I got. I can just bypass the labels and put my <laughs> song out there on the internet, and everybody can find it. But now every every music maker on the planet is doing that. So, can I yeah. can I reframe that and sure, just please, get please, your please. thoughts on it? Yeah. Um, okay, so we're back at the turn of the twentieth century. Puccini writes an <laughs> opera, and from the time he writes it to the time it's produced, an insane amount of investment has taken place from time yes. to work on many people's parts, costuming, staging, learning mm -hmm. it. There's got to be great financial backing and all of that, whether financial or time investment is on the shoulders of what they might perceive as talent or ability that's been developed. Yes. Um, and that is a wonderful barrier of entry in ways mm -hmm. that someone yeah. has to really want it. They have to have the ability or have worked right. out the ability. There has to be luck, of course, but there's a lot of things that have to matriculate and take place for that production to happen. Mm -hmm. Whereas now in this digital revolution, I can wake up tomorrow and on a whim have a sudden burst of inspiration walk out here and literally in an hour, I could have it out there yes. ready for everyone. Absolutely. Is that... I wonder, is that good for art? Ooh, good for art. Ooh, I would, well, my gut reaction immediately is to say that I might distinguish between good for art and good for people. I think it might be great for people. It's given people more access, you know. Um, there are tons of people who would have never been able to make a record in the past that, Garage Band comes for free on their computer now, uh, and and I want to think that for people, for creative people, um, for any people, for all people, that that's a really cool thing. Um, but I, I do think that there's a little bit of a flip side to that, um, and I well, hmm, let me ruminate on that one a little bit because I like where that's going, but I'm not. Sh not sure what I think of that. What do you think of that? I, it's, it's, a, it's a really unfair <laughs> question. I, I, I'm aware of that, but it's something I ponder a lot. Mm -hmm. um, that what is... To, to what will do we appeal for creation? Is it the mm -hmm. want to create? Is it the want to reflect? And what are you reflecting upon? And does that require... Um, enough thought for that to um, meet up in the middle and create something that's not there just for the sake of creating it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And obviously mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. only, you know, that's a limited perspective and that perspective is from purely thinking about um, do we in this age have a free pass to call everything and anything art because it can all be released? Ooh, now that's getting into some really deep thinking. Um, ooh, um, I mean, I have heard a lot of people, this is a little bit of an aside, but, but this is where I'm going with it. Um, recently, I wouldn't assume you to be a Taylor Swift fan, <laughs> but uh, one of the big talking points about her new record, which of course was huge, successful, um, was it's, it's a double album, right? Um, and, you know, and, and in the things that I was reading, it, it was being said that, well, you know, this is a, a quote-unquote double album, but if you're comparing it to the double albums of the 70s, so, you know, this is like a quadruple album, time lengthwise. <laughs> this, this is huge. You know, so it's, and I'm sure that there's not a single Swifty out there who's upset about that. More Taylor Swift, the better, right? Um, but I did see a lot of people talking about, like, well, just because she can release 60 songs all at once, should she? Mm. And I thought that... Um, while I, I know one side of the aisle could say, well, that's still just a, kind of a, a snotty thing to say. I think that there's a legitimate point there. As an art maker myself, I couldn't ever imagine uh, just releasing everything that I'd written that year all in one big dump, even if I was very successful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so maybe that might come back around. It, does that connect to sort of what you were saying before? In a way, or is that a little off base? No, I think that's in the. I think that's in a similar vein. Okay. Um, I think back to 
composers like Mozart or some of these um, these giants and how prolif- prolific they were. Of course, even with that, they're still... Uh, takes a little bit more time to physically write everything out. But, um, <laughs> I didn't realize that that was that big of an album that she released. Oh, it's huge. Yeah. It, yeah. I, I haven't even got through the whole thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's a big listen. Um, and you know, like there's, there's a lot of great songs on it. You know, I, I, I love a lot of top 40 pop whenever I'm in the mood for it. So no disrespect to Miss Swift for any, please any Swifties out there. Don't kill me, please. Well, well it seems like, um, there's a, a word that is, um, tricky to deal with and that is art mm-hmm. right because that's that's at the yeah. core of what we're i think maybe what we're really throwing back and forth is yeah is and what is what is art and does it matter mm. but i mean i think it's interesting that a lot of your idols and i I think i might put you in this category mm. find it of value to add the word art in front of another genre Mm. like rock like there is yeah. value in doing yeah. that mm-hmm. um or there is i i would venture a guess that for most uh for a handful of more than a handful of people they might automatically categorize opera as art mm. and i also wonder if that is a really great use of that word is it is a step into pulling whatever you're doing into a specific artistic realm Hmm. without having to use that word and if there are these continual steps to send the message that something is artful then that means that there's meaning for that word and that it means something that something is artful or can be viewed Hmm. as art and if that's the case then i think the the obfuscation of what that is by means of having infinite content it's probably not. It's probably a challenging thing for what art uh, will evolve into as we keep moving forward. Ooh. I want to go back to something you said just a second ago, and just make a quick comment on that. That um, I think art's important. I think defining art hard to do. Yeah, <laughs> and maybe it changes over time a little bit in, in ways. Uh, in a way, um, but I'm not sure exactly what that means either. Well, yeah, there's different different music. If just keeping it in the realm of music, even sure. there's different music serves different functions, and I wonder mm-hmm. if mm-hmm. Uh, this is not genre based. Um, yeah. I'm going to use this word not thinking of genre, but if I wonder if artful music pulls the population forward. Mm-hmm. Um, that it requires mm-hmm. some thought, it requires some reflection. That by the time you've you've consumed it you're maybe not quite the same because of that journey. Whereas if pop music is um, reflecting what's already there in the population, Mm -hmm. it's canvassing what is a trend, what is consumed, and we're going to take that and package it. And that is the differentiation between uh, pop and art. I wonder, on very basic terms, if in that framing um, it can position why someone might want their work to be considered art versus not. Or maybe I have those exactly reversed. You know? This reminds me of, well, well, two things, I guess. Um, the first one is Rick Rubin. You familiar with him? Oh, yeah. Producer Rick Rubin, right? Um, he, he did an interview um, that, that's been floating around online. It's, it's uh, on Instagram and YouTube. I, I see it kind of pop up a lot. Where he says, uh, the audience comes last. And of course, everybody goes, whoa, 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 what do you mean the audience comes last? The customer's always right, that sort of thing, right? And he's like, well, no, you know, the the audience might not know what they want, you know, except the only thing that the audience has to draw from is what's already came before. I think it is, is part of what he's trying to say. Um, and, you know, if you want to do something new from the heart that's really going to get the audience's attention in this fresh uh, creative way, um, then, you know, then the, we, we don't have to worry about, it. we don't need to worry about what they think because, you know, we're, we're giving them, giving them something from our, from the heart that, that's, that's true and real. Um, now that's me just kind of dis- dissecting what I think he's trying to say. Um, 
but it also the second part makes me think about AI, which I I know we're is probably going to come up in this conversation anyway. Um, but I think there's a similar thing going on there, where the all, all, all that it can reproduce is an an amalgamation of something from the past. Um, so I wonder if this idea of art is tied to um, new ideas and sort of a progressive thought, not political progressive thought necessarily, just um, a, a forward thinking of ideas. And that doesn't mean throwing the past away or throwing tradition away or anything like that, um, but doing something that still feels fresh um, for its for its own end, for its own means, I guess. Um, yeah, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think. <laughs> you got me after a six-hour bus ride. I, yeah, I know. This is pretty brutal. <laughs> Come right in and we go at it. But, you know, this, this is great. I think these are when I there, – there are a lot of conversations happening right now. Yeah. And a lot of them are centered in um, politics or uh, things that are just – right or left of politics mm-hmm, to, mm-hmm. not to be a pun there yeah. and while obviously those are important conversations um, I, I feel that in many ways the what has had its pulse on the progress of where humans go um, long before politics was around was arts in some way mm-hmm. And I think these conversations are important to be had, not to suggest what is right or wrong, but to examine and re-examine and dissect what mm-hmm. we might already do. And one thing I love about having you here is you're coming from, um, you know about music in the same similar ways that I know about music, the technicalities, but you, the vantage that you have um, is something that is so foreign from where I come from. So it's... It's so great to get to hear your thoughts on that. And it's great to talk about stuff with you, as always. Great. I, mean, I could go on for another hour on this, <laughs> all of this stuff, uh, and I think we do have to have you back so we can dive into AI. That sounds great. Let's do it sometime. All right. Well, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. We're going to keep it a little sounds container good. there. Yeah, Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We, I know we could just yeah, go all night. Yeah,